ओके सो इट्स टाइम वील स्टार्ट एनी वे सो फर्स्टली गुड आफ्टरनून एवरी वन आई नो इट्स द ऑट टाइम है यूजली वी डोंट हैव क्लासेस एट दिस टाइम बट बिकॉज ऑफ पर्सनल रीजन आई कूडन टेक अ क्लास येस टे सो दिस क्लास इज इन सब्सटीट्यूट फॉर दैट राइट सो वील बी डीलिंग विथ चैप्टर भक्ति एंड सूफी ट्रेडिशंस राइट आई थिंक दिस दिस इज द लास्ट बट वन क्लास वील बी डीलिंग विद दैट द क्लास इज फॉर इन ट्वेल्थ स्टैंडर्ड राइट नाउ या तुषार इज योर बट तुषार दिस इज नॉट द इलेवेंथ स्टैंडर्ड क्लास now for the 12th standard the class is happening but for y'all it is at today 6 pm your class is still there okay uh no problem but you can join at 6 right at 6 o'clock it's for 11th standard now the class is for 12th people right um anyways firstly good afternoon uh, welcome back welcome back so i'm hoping everybody is having a good weekend but it's tiresome because exams are approaching so Anyways, uh, we'll quickly start uh, without further ado. So, as you all know, my name is Nikita, and I'm the history educator here at an academy, and I take classes for both standard eleventh and twelfth. A little bit about the Telegram channel. If you all haven't joined already, uh, as a part of the scholars Telegram channel, I highly request you all to go do that because. it's really really beneficial uh, to get the updates on as to what is happening on the youtube channel right if you if there's any cancellation of class or if there is there's any postponement of class uh, you will be given updates on the telegram channel so i highly recommend go uh, so join the the telegram channel right and the link for that is in the description below so you can go and check that out uh also a little update um the emerge test usually happens for uh, standard 10 and standard 12 so basically it means it applies to all and it happens every week right so the features are these questions are aligned with the latest cbse guidelines and these are live mock tests which are conducted every week as i've told you so it's really really beneficial it lack like some kind of practice for your term one boards so i highly recommend go check that out again the link for this is also in the description below check it out and okay regarding the unacademy plus and iconic features just to start off with plus uh, there are n number of features for example you can sit at your own houses and listen to some of the top educators live classes and these are all available on one single platform which is unacademy plus so you don't have to juggle between apps and different websites in search of your courses uh, all available on a single platform and then there are regular doubt clearing sessions there are regular answer writing sessions along with practice tests and live test series and the the syllabus is covered in a very exhaustive manner so you don't really have to worry about missing out on a particular topic and there's mentorship given to you there's guidance given to you which uh, and also study materials in the form of pdf so these are really really helpful again especially during your examination times for revision sort of thing so please go ahead and subscribe to an academy plus and the range of subscriptions are as follows as you can see on the screen there are a uh, six types which is a 3 month subscription a 9 month a 12 month 15 month 18 months and 24 yeah the prices are there have a look at them and go ahead with whichever one you feel comfortable quickly moving on to iconic here the features are even better and greater than an academy plus for example there's personal mentorship given to you there are live doubt clearing sessions there are weekly reports and there's a direct parent connect between your parent and your mentor and finally there are study planners provided to you so that is really really helpful again and regarding the iconic pricing the durations are the same just like plus but the the pricing might change a little bit here and there so again they're visible on the screen have a look at them and feel free to subscribe and lastly before actually going on to the content for today there are something called special classes which are available to you uh, free access the way you can access them is actually by downloading the unacademy learning app 
uh, on your mobile phone from the Google Play Store and then log in into the app with proper credentials like username, password and then select your goal which is 12th standard, right? And then on the menu button on the top left corner, there's an option called special. Click on that, it'll ask you for a code. You can use this code which is TUM10, right? And then you'll be given access to this uh, special content. And that's again helpful. Anyways, um, so we'll quickly move on to what we'll be discussing for today. But in the meanwhile, a couple of y'all joined. Uh, good afternoon, everyone who just joined. Okay. Um, we'll move on then. So again, guys, heads up to all the 12th standard students. This is good. This is not the last class on this chapter. Yeah. This is almost like part seven. We still have one part to go, right? The last pages of the chapter, which we'll do in the next class, which is on Monday, right? So again, I'm giving you a heads up one week before, almost five days before. After finishing the chapter on Monday, we'll be having a quiz on the same chapter on Wednesday, right? Which is 6th of October. So telling y'all prior, be prepared if y'all want to because I know for a fact this chapter is a little bit difficult. Yeah, so the questions are also going to be difficult. So please prepare yourself. Um, anyways, uh, we'll continue. So today we'll be talking about uh, new devotional paths, yeah, which have emerged in the Indian subcontinent during the medieval period and how did the dialogue happen between these devotional paths and how did it descend in the northern part of India, right? So that's the next sub-theme in your textbook. So what actually are the dialogues or discourses happening right at that point of time we we'll look at them in great detail yeah so basically we are going to discuss personalities here like not ideologies in particular but we are going to talk about personalities and their what they believed in right how did they spread their message or what they believed in we'll be talking about three influential figures yeah the first one is Kabir. Everybody must have heard the name Kabir Das, right? The second is Guru Nanak, founder of uh, Sikh religion, yeah. And the third is Mirabai, right? We won't be covering Mirabai today, but we'll talk about Mirabai in the next class. But just remember that under this sub theme, we'll be studying three figures Kabir, Guru Nanak, and Mirabai, right? So these are all poets poets right they used to write poems very extensively in great detail and also in a very simple manner so that normal people like common people can read and understand the poem right these were initially poets but later on because of their philosophical ideologies they have turned into saints so these people are often referred to as poet saints yeah so these poet saints have engaged in explicit and implicit dialogue with these new social situations, ideas and institutions. So what was basically happening in the medieval India? We have seen the emergence of n number of traditions, right? Be it Veera Shaivism, be it a materialist, you know, like be it Ajivika, whatever the situation is, there were so many different traditions that were coming up in the Indian subcontinent during the medieval period. Yeah. So these poet saints, Kabir, Guru Nanak, Mirabai and even others are there, but in your textbook they are not mentioned. Yeah. So all these poet saints have started interacting with all those traditions. There were so many debates happening between them. There were so many discussions slash negotiations. Yeah. Because of that, uh, their personal experiences have been shaped in a certain manner. For example, Kabir is talking with Veera Shaivites, right? He might agree with the Veera Shaiva philosophy. He might not agree. Yeah, it totally depends on him, what he believes in. So after discussing so much with other traditions, finally, he established his own principles, right? The same applies to Guru Nanak and Mirabai as well. So we look in detail as to who these personalities are and what did they advocate. Yeah, so that's like a brief introduction to the subtopic. Okay. 
Okay, Yash is here with us. Uh, good afternoon, Yash. Hello. Um, anyways, so the first person we'll be dealing with is Kabir, as I've told you. Again, it's titled as Weaving a Divine Fabric. Yeah, nothing but formulating, formulating some divine set of principles. And that's done by Kabir, right? So, who is Kabir, right? Again, as I was telling you, his occupation initially was a poet. Later, he turned into a poet saint. And to be very specific, he lived in the late 14th and early 15th centuries. Yeah? So, like, there are so many poet saints. But immediately when you listen to that word called poet saints, for anyone most probably, the one figure that will strike in their mind immediately is Kabir. Right? Because we have heard so much about him right from childhood right if you ask like a third fourth standard kid who kabir is they'll tell you if, if not the philosophies and ideologies at least that person must have heard of kabir's name right so that's how popular and influential the figure of kabir was and even now he is influential right so the thing about kabir is he hasn't written anything about his personal details anywhere on in the manuscripts or uh, some recorded documents, right? Nowhere. You go through hundreds and hundreds of manuscripts. You go through hundreds of his poems. Nowhere he mentioned what his personal details are. We just know his name. We don't know anything. Who his father is, who his mother is, what his social background is, what his economic background is. Yeah? So we do not know anything about Kabir. That is why it is a very tough job for historians. Yeah, there's so much pain, there's so much effort involved to study about Kabir. Historians have actually gone through this trouble. Yeah, and somehow through some random sources because of other people writing biographies a bit about Kabir. Yeah, through some random sources, we got like little, little information about Kabir's life right so these are very very difficult to be honest but initially we didn't have any information but as some scholars did an extensive research on kabir like i know a couple of historians who have dedicated their whole life to studying kabir that's how difficult he is to read right so hey geographies are again biographies of saints right somebody else used to write about kabir's life be it his disciples yeah, be it somebody who lived after Kabir, whatever the situation is, they have written some hagiographies from which we get information about Kabir. Yeah. So, verses ascribed to Kabir have been compiled in three different but overlapping traditions. Again, one thing you all need to remember is Kabir Das or Mirabai or Guru Nanak, these are not considered as gods. They are not gods. They just believe in some ideology. They have a tradition for themselves. They, didn't, they never wanted to establish any sort of religion per se. Yeah, they never had an idea of establishing a religion. It's just that they wanted to propagate and spread these moral ideologies. Yeah, so whatever Kabir said and wrote in the form of poems and compositions, Three other religions have borrowed from these sources, borrowed from his poems and adopted as a part of their religious books, right? So what is the point here? The religions are being influenced by Kabir. That is how important he was. Yeah. Okay. Uh, guys, any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, just put them down in the chat box. I'll answer them whenever I have a look at them. Yeah. So, okay. So, there are also many uh, books slash compositions written on him. Yeah. The first one is Kabir Bijak. The spelling is here. It's Kabir Bijak. Yeah. Kabir Bijak is, uh, is a composition. Yeah. It is preserved by the Kabir Pant. Kabir Pant is nothing but the followers of Kabir, right? People who believe in the ideology of Kabir, people who follow the path of Kabir, right? So they are called as Kabir Pant and these people 
दे यूजली रिसाइड इन वाराणसी विच इज इन प्रेजेंट डे उत्तर प्रदेश एंड ऑल्सो एरिया सराउंडिंग वाराणसी राइट सो दे केम अप विद दिस कॉम्पोजिशन कॉल्ड कबीर बीज एंड दे वेरी सेफली प्रिजर्व इट दे हैव बिन प्रिजर्विंग इट फॉर सो मेनी सेंचुरीज नाउ या सो द नेक्स्ट वन इज कबीर ग्रंथ वली कबीर ग्रंथावली अदरवाइज या इट इज यूजली एसोसिएटेड विद दादू पंथ इन राजस्थान अगेन दादू बाय इज अनदर इम्पॉर्टेंट रिलीजियस फिगर हिज फॉलोअर्स आर कॉल्ड एज दादू पंथ एंड दे यूजली रिसाइड इन राजस्थान राइट सो दीज पीपल एक्चुअली आर एसोसिएटेड विद कबीर ग्रंथावली विच इज अनदर फेमस बुक रिटन अबाउट कबीर राइट एंड मोस्ट ऑफ द कॉम्पोजिशन विच ही डिड इन कबीर ग्रंथावली दे आर फाउंड इन प्रेजेंट डेज आदि ग्रंथ साहेब या सो वॉट आर वी सींग नाउ हिज वर्सेज और हिज कॉम्पोजिशन आर बींग बोरोड बाय अदर ट्रेडिशन राइट सो ऑल ऑफ दीज मैन्यूस्क्रिप्ट कंपाइलेशन दे वर नॉट प्रिपेयर वेन ही वॉज अलाइव दिस इज द केस विद मोस्ट रिलीजियस फिलोसफर्स इवन बुद्धा महावीरा वेन वी वर टॉकिंग अबाउट दैम इन द प्रीवियस चैप्टर्स वी हैव सीन दैट सो मेनी बायोग्राफीज ऑफ दैम केम अप आफ्टर दे डाइड आफ्टर देअर लाइफ right in the same manner after kabir died so many manuscripts and compilations on him came up after his death right and finally by almost 19th century yeah anthologies of verses which are basically collections of poems yeah so the whichever whatever are attributed to kabir they were circulating within the society in large numbers Yeah, 19th century. So everybody knows that by 19th century, the culture of print was already there in India. Yeah, Britishers have brought in the culture of print. Now Kabir's philosophy or Kabir's poems, they are they are actually being printed on a piece of paper and they are being circulated within the society among people, right? And the most influential regions or where the followers of Kabir are more in number. are three namely which is bengal gujarat and maharashtra right very very famous for uh, kabir's philosophy um cool any questions till here okay jagrati joined us uh, hello jagrati good afternoon okay i do not see any questions therefore i'll move forward uh cool then so kabir's poems again when he was alive like whatever he was writing he made sure that he is writing in whichever language he knows yeah obviously because he doesn't know every other language in which whichever language he is familiar with he is writing poems in those languages but also making sure that they are being translated into other languages because he wants his message to spread across the indian subcontinent he wants everybody to read read his message read his philosophy right because it's a good moral thing good ethical thing so that is why he made sure that they, they were translated into no, not just different languages but also different dialects right and some are composed in the special language of nirguna poets the sant bhasha right so again this there was a special kind of language for nirguna poets yeah nirguna poets are poets who basically believe in the formlessness of god right like no physical structure attributed to god right so these kind of nirguna poets used to follow something called sant bhasha sant bhasha is basically nothing but the vernacular language or the language which people speak like common people speak yeah so kabir also compiled poems in the languages that people are familiar with yeah okay so the other forms of poem poem writing is uh, ullat bansi yeah ullat bansi if you translate it to english it roughly translates to upside down sayings yeah again 
this might not make sense because it's just a metaphorical figure yeah but i'll just give you like uh, what an upside down saying examples are yeah just hold on to that but just remember that these are other forms of uh, in which kabir wrote poetry when he was alive yeah so in these poems whatever the content is saying is basically the reverse or the inverted message of the everyday meanings yeah it's totally the opposite or like some counterpoint so why why is he writing in such a manner and one answer we have to that is uh, the hint at these difficulties of capturing the nature of the ultimate reality in words what is he saying he says that there is some kind of ultimate reality in the world yeah definitely like he believes that there is some supernatural power but he doesn't know who that is is it allah is it krishna is it um, vishnu shiva is it jesus he don't he doesn't know but he knows that there is some supernatural figure and he doesn't want to name he doesn't know whether it's a male or a female yeah so but there is some kind of ultimate reality which exists in this world and it is very very difficult for us as humans to know what that ultimate reality is yeah it is not in the human capacity to ever understand the meaning of ultimate reality that is what kabir believes in yeah so to kind of uh, justify that in the form of poems that is why he writes his poems in a very difficult manner yeah because he wants people to understand that the poems are difficult because the real world is also difficult yeah some kind of analogy cool um so lastly what are the some, what are, what are some of the examples of expressions that he used in his poems right he says lotus which blooms without a flower that is one line in his poem is that practically possible no because only if a blue uh, flower blooms th- like then the lotus flower will be there right like without blooming it's not a lotus flower it's just some kind of random narrow thing covered with green color petals but once it blooms it becomes a lotus flower yeah so he's saying lotus which blooms without a flower that's practically not possible also like another example is fire raging in the ocean again impractical one Pra- fire definitely can't stay in the ocean obviously because of the water force the fire will be put off so these are some of the reversal things or like these are facts which go against nature right he deliberately or he wantedly uses the use these phrases in order to deliver the message of the difficulty of understanding the ultimate reality right so that kinds of conveys a message to us that kabir believed in mystical experiences right okay exactly jagrati you have a point kabir believed in nirguna bhakti where there is no form of god absolutely right jagrati just like many other uh, philosophers we know right like even buddha per se even uh, mahavira per se believed in the uh, nirguna bhakti yeah okay any questions till here okay cool no questions then we'll uh, move on right so also okay so he knows for a fact he can't really understand what the ultimate reality is yeah but in order to reach that ultimate reality there are certain ways you can follow right there is something you can do in order to be peaceful after your death yeah so he actually borrowed from a range of traditions i was telling you right like he had so many conversations negotiations with uh, other traditions 
Veera Shaivism and different other traditions that were existing in the society at that point of time in medieval period. So because of these conversations, he like based on those conversations, he designed his ultimate ideology, right? So what is his ideology? He drew upon different aspects of different religions, right? For example, we look at the first point here, which says um, he described the ultimate reality as Allah, Khuda, Hazrat and Peer. Again, he had discussions with so many Muslim leaders, Muslim religious leaders. Yeah, he described that ultimate reality in one way can be defined as Allah, yeah, Khuda, Hazrat, Peer. These are all different names for Allah in Muslim religion, right? No, again, okay. Peer is a religious leader, yeah. Hazrat is also some sort of person who teaches you Arabic uh, and other Urdu languages, right? So, these are the names associated with Islam. From there, he borrowed these words and said that this is one kind of way in which he can describe the ultimate reality. And the next tradition that he looked at is Vedantic tradition. Yeah. From the Vedantic tradition, he borrowed certain words like Alak, Nirakar, Brahman, Atman and some other words. Right. So what does basically Alak mean? Alak is the unseen. So what is he saying here? God cannot be seen. Like you as a human being, you just can't see God. Yeah. Why is that so? Because he doesn't have a physical form. He's in the form of a nirakar, like formless, right? That is why you can't see him. So these are some of the elements which he borrowed from the Vedantic traditions, right? And finally, he looked at some of the yogic traditions, right? Which were very famous again in the 14th, 15th centuries. And he borrowed connotations like Shabda and Shunya, which are basically sound and emptiness from the yogic traditions right and diverse and sometimes conflicting ideas are expressed in these poems so again i'll tell you what an example is but before that whatever he was writing like within a single poem sometimes he kinds of supports one religion sometimes he kinds of says no that religion is a crap yeah so there are some kinds of conflicts but again he has his own explanation for it for every sentence he was writing he has a logic behind it yeah so we look at one such example right which are conflicting ideas within the same poem so this one right like some poems they stress on the fact that you are supposed to follow monotheism Monotheism is nothing but believing in one God, believing that there is only one God. Yeah, that is one of the Islamic ideas. That is what Muslims follow. For them, Allah is the only God. Yeah, so there using the Islamic philosophy, he says that you need to follow monotheism and also iconoclasm. Iconoclasm is no idol worship. Yeah, whatever idols or statues of there are gods, you should get rid of them that is iconoclasm right so he uses these points from islamic philosophy and uses those to criticize hindus he's like hindus are not following the correct way they are they are praying to so many gods like n number of gods vishnu shiva avatars of vishnu like some other subsects of it yeah that is not how the world works. World works and believes in the monotheistic philosophy. So he criticizes Hindus based on their polytheism and also idol worship, right? Because he believes in Nirguna. And that is one stance, basically um, criticizing Hindus. Yeah. And if you look at other set of poems, yeah, some other poems, he actually... Um, uses the concepts of zikr and ishq which are again islamic terms uh, basically referring to love right and he expresses the hindu practice of nam simran so what do hindus basically do 
as as some form of worship they keep remembering the god's name like even you have those one or two beads right like while counting all those beads the, the one thing which you like do in your mind is like repeating god's name for every bead right so what is that basically remembering and chanting the god's name that is a tradition of hindu religion so he says that that tradition is good so now hindus are good here so at, in some poems he is criticizing hindus in some poems he is you know like supporting hindus he says that's good something is bad so that is what basically i mean by conflicting ideas right but again he has his own logic to it yeah okay uh jagrati um uh, yes jagrati you're right in very very simple words we we don't know we can't see gods god like even though you pray to god how much ever you want you sit under a tree do meditation for years and years together still you can't see god in a physical form that is the reality everybody knows that right that and that is because um, god is formless that is what kabir believes in right so yeah you're right jagrati uh, that's a well structured point yeah uh abirami uh the session is going to be only in english yeah so i'm not well versed in hindi so it's going to be a english uh, session abirami okay so that's about um kabir yeah okay we're not done with him yet we still have a couple of slides to go um so whatever we we've discussed that there are thousands and thousands of poems right so out of those were all of them composed by kabir that's the question like we need to ask it right because we are telling that there are thousands and thousands of poems D- did he have the ability to compose so many poems in his lifetime did he did do that did his followers do that did he appoint somebody to do it we do not know we do not have an answer for that yeah that still remains a question which is unanswered right so to start off um again the point i just made right with certainty like with determination we can't pinpoint and tell that this particular verse is written by kabir and the other verses are written by somebody else because all these poems are anonymous we don't know whether kabir wrote it or kabir's followers wrote it yeah scholars have tried their level best like they put in so much effort to analyze uh the, the kind of language used in the poems right the kind of style or the kind of content which was used in the poems you know like the scholars basically had this that if they try to analyze all these things at least they will come to some kind of conclusion that okay fine like these verses belong to kabir or these verses belong to somebody else but no that was not the case because it was really really difficult to decipher his style language and content till date like even the 21st century we don't know whether all the poems are written by him or somebody else right um uh, again but one thing we we know is there's a rich corpus of verses basically huge collection of his poems or his ideological poems right so what does that signify why is that important we know for a fact that because kabir wrote all this somebody must have obviously read them right he is writing so many things because there are a lot of audience yeah so for example like people like me if i read kabir yeah and then i'm inspired by them i will start questioning religious and social institutions ideas and practices in their search for divine because kabir also criticizes them if i believe in kabir i'll obviously follow all the principles mentioned by him 
and start questioning religious and social institutions just like he did when he was alive right so again he was a huge source of inspiration for every rational thinker that was present in the medieval and even modern times yeah so just as kabir's ideas probably crystallized through dialogue and debate yeah again constant debates constant discussions have been happening between kabir and other religious traditions within the 15th century right B between yogic traditions between sufi traditions yeah these were majorly happening in the region of avadh right avadh is again a part of present day uttar pradesh so because of the conversations kabir's ideas got crystallized or they got consolidated right and his legacy was claimed by several groups who remembered him and continue to do so you know the unique thing with kabir is hindus will come and be like kabir was a hindu therefore he's ours muslims will come and be like kabir is ours because muslim was a sorry kabir was a muslim some other religion will come up and they'll be like no kabir belonged to this particular religion so he's ours so that kind of fight or that kind of conflicts happen even today yeah everybody wants to claim that kabir belonged to their group that's how famous and influential he was right uh okay any questions till here okay tanishk has a request about the bhakti sufi quiz uh tanish we still have a little more to do on uh, monday right uh, regarding the sufi uh, bhakti sufi traditions i promise on wednesday we are definitely having a quiz no more dragging this chapter because we've already dealt with this chapter for almost two weeks now yeah uh, tanishk uh, as promised i will definitely have a quiz on wednesday 6th of october but uh, tomorrow it is not possible tanishk okay so right then we'll continue regarding how people wanted kabir to be a part of their group and they even claim that uh, they they kabir was their uh, religious member right again there are so many debates happening even now in the 21st century like various religious leaders sit and they contest that uh hindu he was a hindu yeah or or he was like hindu philosophers will come and say that he was a hindu muslim philosophers will be like no kabir was actually a muslim yeah and all of these should have some kind of evidences right because randomly people can't say things there needs to be some kind of source or proof so for this they lie back on the hagiographies as i was telling you there are n number of hagiographies written on kabir so if you read one hagiography one author must have written that he was a hindu the other author must have written that he was a muslim that is why there's a lot of confusion right so again usually all of these hagiographies they were composed from the 17th century onwards yeah I'm, I'm sorry yeah so basically they were composed after his death right so again now just to look just to look at a few examples as to how people claimed that kabir was theirs um hagiography is written within the vaishnava tradition right vaishnavism is nothing but hinduism right like a, a subsect of hindu they attempted to suggest that he was born a hindu right irrespective of how he grew up while but like while he came on to the earth like when he was born he was born to a hindu couple like hindu mother and father right but something happened after that and he lost his parents or something that is when he actually he was adopted by a muslim couple like a poor muslim family and then he grew up there they also tell that kabir was not his original name yeah 
because kabir in some sense is kind of related to arabic words which means great arabic meaning it's re- it's related to islam so hindus deny that his original name was kabir but instead he was born to a hindu family but later was raised by a poor muslim family and this poor muslim family they belong to some they were some kind of weavers yeah weavers in traditional terms is also called as julahas right these kind of weavers were also initially hindus only but as the muslim invasions kept happening they very recently converted to islam so overall the vaishnava tradition claims that their biological parents are hindus and even their foster parents initially were hindus but later converted to islam right so by saying all this they are trying to associate their religion with kabir right um, they also suggest, some other sources suggest that he was initiated into bhakti by a guru perhaps ramananda again the same vaishnava tradition ramananda was one popular guru within the vaishnava tradition they say that at some point of time in his life ramananda uh sorry so ramananda was the guru of um, kabir like kabir basically followed ramananda and then he adopted the bhakti path so again basically concluding that he is a hindu yeah that is his that is their main view point um okay any questions till here guys any questions please put them down in the chat box um okay no ma'am cool uh, thanks jagruti i'm hoping it's clear for everybody else as well Uh, we'll continue but we still have a couple of slides to cover so again the claiming session was happening there are lots of debates happening however uh, these verses attributed to kabir yeah uses the words guru and sadguru so whenever you look at some composition that reflects kabir's ideology yeah like even um, okay we'll look in the next next couple of slides but just a slight of hint here that kabir's poems were actually are actually a part of sikh religious books not just sikhs but also some kind of hindu religious books right so what does this basically mean his poems were adopted into the other religious uh, books right so if you look at those religious books you will never come across the word called kabir itself yeah but instead he was referred to as some kind of guru or other word which was used is sat guru right sat guru and guru yeah but the specific name of a teacher is never mentioned yeah the specificity of the name uh, is never mentioned so pre- preceptor is nothing but a teacher right okay again so going back to the claim that vaishnava tradition people made that ramananda was the guru of kabir yeah historians have actually analyzed that statement yeah they have gone to gone through n number of sources and finally they concluded that ramananda and kabir are not contemporaries contemporaries is nothing but they did not live during the same era ramananda was born much earlier he was there he lived he died after that after a couple of decades then kabir was born if that is the case how was ramananda the, the teacher of kabir obviously it's impossible right so that is what historians say that whatever the claims that vaishnava tradition people are making it's absolutely false because there is no way that ramananda and kabir are contemporaries they have lived in different eras right so whatever 
the, the point which we understand from this is when you look at sources especially religious sources you should never take them at the face value you should not blindly believe whatever the religious sources are saying yeah because sometimes they might be exaggerations sometimes they might be totally false statements yeah that's why it's important for us to corroborate that with some kind of historical evidence because we are history students right you definitely have to associate that with some kind of historical evidence and then come to a conclusion whether the statements mentioned in the religious books are right or wrong yeah but again irrespective of all that kabir as a figure as i'm repeating my point again is very very influential even now there are a couple there are like a bunch of people who actually believe in the ideologies of kabir who treat kabir as some kind of mystical figure and they borrow they borrow the legacy of kabir right um cool so that's about kabir very very prominent figure again um now we'll quickly move on to baba guru nanak the second important figure which i told you that we'll be discussing as a part of the sub theme we still have another one which is meera bai we won't be doing that today yeah we'll be doing it tomorrow uh, so not tomorrow the next class which is on monday right um baba guru nanak right again a very familiar name okay but before that jagrati has a question what is the meaning of legacy right um again how do i put this legacy is some kind of um, drawing your lineage from that person right L- let's say uh, i am an ex person and i want to draw a legacy from king akbar then i'll be like my ancestors my ancestors they are descendants of akbar like there's some kind of blood relation between me and akbar right so that is what uh, legacy is yeah i'm hoping that's clear jagrati they believe in the principles basically they have that some kind of sense of belonging or some kind of personal relation between them yeah okay point is clear cool okay quickly we'll move on to uh, baba guru nanak yeah and the sacred world so unlike kabir we actually know when guru nanak was born and when he died yeah uh, to specify it he was born in the year 1469 yeah this is almost like a century after kabir was born and he was he was like he left the world in 1539 right fair enough like he almost lived for 70 years roughly uh, he was a good man yeah so initially he was born into a hindu family like his original parents were hindus and they, it's not like they are poor or low class families they were rich enough they had a good lifestyle and be, because they were merchants right basically a hindu merchant family and the original place of birth was nankana sahib right where was this located exactly this village was located on the banks of river ravi yeah river river ravi again very very famous uh, and it was in the predominantly muslim punjab ravi is in punjab nankana sahib is near the river ravi so basically baba gurunanak was a punjabi and that kind of like that particular region was dominated by muslims but his family was a hindu family right don't get confused he belonged to a hindu family but the local society which was around him was majorly dominated by muslims right okay so he he received good education he trained he was trained to be an accountant right like being an accountant back in um, 15 16th centuries is a good thing so now we basically have to understand that he belonged to a well educated family 
because he was an accountant himself and also he studied persian right and he was married at a very young age just like everybody was married at a young age back in those times right um but he was kind of drawn towards all these uh, philosophies especially baktas and sufis philosophies so even though he was married he he was never with his family he always used to spend a lot of time among these uh, devotional people uh, mainly sufis and baktas right and because of that also he also traveled very widely from punjab he went to different places to talk to different sufi saints to talk to different bhakti saints to to um, enlarge his scope of knowledge right so he did that because he was very interested in all these ideological philosophies yeah and whatever baba guru nanak believed in how do we know that we know that when we read his when we look at what was the, what were the kind of teachings that he did and also the kind of hymns that he composed again baba guru nanak was also a poet right because he is also a poet saint so he wrote some of the poems he wrote some hymns and if you read those hymns you will understand what philosophy did he believe in right so this is just like a brief background information as to who baba guru nanak was like his family background yeah so now we look at what he actually believed in right so the first one is he advocated the form of nirguna bhakti very similar to kabir he says that god doesn't have a form god do not have a physical feature he cannot be seen therefore all the worshipers we need to follow some kind of nirguna bhakti right don't put up all these idols statues don't worship some kind of rocks and non living things instead believe that god doesn't have a form and therefore just remember god in your mind or in your heart that is how you are going to worship god right so that was his a uh, major philosophy and he firmly repudiated the external practices of religions he saw around him as he was growing up uh, uh, he was kind of exposed to a lot of religions right hinduism um, under hinduism also vaishnavism shaivism veera shaivism like n number of traditions that were existing within the 15th century indian society right he looked at so many like extra extra material things like you know like for example sacrifices right you you're killing somebody like be it an animal be it a human but you are killing somebody at the cost of something that is wrong according to baba guru nanak right and even ritual baths you don't know like you're going you're dipping yourself in water and you're saying that by dipping yourself in water you're getting rid of all your sins or whatever mistakes you have committed but how far is that true it's just water you're going and dipping that doesn't mean you're getting rid of all your sins and also like image worship right the same point i made earlier nirguna bhakti right and also some other kind of extra extra austerities and also the scriptures of hindus and muslims the the holy books right bhagavad gita quran and all these stuff he rejected all of these he was like no they are not legitimate they they are all extra things you you do not need to do all that yeah so basically he was criticizing all these things right so again for baba guru nanak just like um, kabir the absolute or rab rab again is god right in hindi also we have a word called rab right rab is god or like the absolute is like the ultimate being right whoever that is we we cannot ascribe a particular gender or a form to that ultimate form ultimate being right we can't say whether he is a man a woman whether he looks like a human or whether he looks like some kind of animal half animal half god no we don't know how he looks yeah it's just some supernatural power we don't know what that power is in the form of right but 
instead of all this he is rejecting all these things which other people are following but instead he sh- he should come up with other alternative philosophy right otherwise people was people will just be like ah kya what whatever he's saying he's talk whatever he's talking is bullshit yeah so in order for people to actually believe in his philosophy he needs to provide an alternative solution yeah so the kind of alternative solution he provides is very very simple yeah this will definitely help you in uh, connecting yourself with divine and what is that you just have to remember and repeat the divine name yeah just again very similar to kabir's philosophy right just keep chanting the divine's name in your mind yeah so that is the only way how you can connect with the ultimate divine that is what he says and he kinds of spread this word how does he spread the word he writes so many poems uh, regarding his philosophy very very simple language usually they are they are written in punjabi and these poems were referred to as shabad right because people around his around him like in in the place which he was residing they used to speak punjabi right it was the language of the people and therefore he wrote all his poems in punjabi and spread his message yeah what was his message keep chanting divine's name then you will ultimately have a connection with the divine right cool so that was his point and uh, he would often sing these compositions like he would often sing these verses or poets in various ragas right like different musical tones and stuff while his attended mardana played the rabab he had an attended like disciple sort of his name was mardana right mardana used to have this one famous musical instrument called rabab right rabab is a musical instrument Mar- mardana used to play this instrument and in the, at the same time guru nanak used to sing these compositions right so again that was another kind of worship for him cool so that was what he believed in and what finally did um, guru nanak do was that he organized all of his followers into a community right he was like whoever believes in this particular philosophy you should be in the you all should reside in the form of a community you all should never fight amongst yourself treat everyone as your brothers yeah like some rules that should be followed within a community right uh he set up rules for congregational worship it's nothing but people gathering and sitting together at some common place yeah and then collectively reciting all the poems right some co- some form of common worship communal worship right that was called as sangat yeah he also arranged for that and also he appointed his, his one of his very very famous disciples whose name was angad right the spelling is here it's a n g a d so after his death he made sure that there is somebody to lead his followers and that somebody is none other than angad right so also like the same tradition was followed while angad was dying he appointed somebody else after that person dies somebody else came into the uh, position right what is that position the position of a preceptor slash teacher right so this kind of tradition was almost followed for around 200 years yeah this was happening and clearly he mentions that this is not some kind of religion my idea is not to establish a new religion yeah he clearly states that but after his death after so many followers were coming up so many uh, different gurus were coming up right they consolidated their practices yeah and in order to distinguish themselves from hindus and muslims and in fact other religions it they were kind of forced to recognize this particular tradition as some kind of religion right initially even though his um, 
his wish was not to establish a new religion but they were kind of forced to do after his death right okay a uh, viber has a question ma'am see okay viber um, i am not really sure because i've never heard of that but i can definitely check uh, sorry can i get back to you probably uh, in the next class because i haven't heard of that episode yeah but i'll definitely look at it or probably like comment down below on this video or like explain the same concept in the next class yeah uh, excuse me for that but i'll definitely get back to you cool okay cool that works for you good um so yeah they were kind of forcefully made to establish a religion for, for themselves anyways so after uh, guru nanak there was uh, a number of gurus that followed him we know that right so out of them the f- there was a fifth preceptor or fifth teacher called as guru arjun right he compiled his hymns along with those of his four successors so whatever hymns that baba guru uh, guru nanak composed along with the hymns that guru arjun and also his successors composed they were actually writing it down on some kinds of manuscripts right not just uh, their compositions but also other poetic verses uh, fall uh, composed by baba farid ravidas and kabir again kabir is coming here kabir is again an important part of uh, sikh philosophy like sikh religion right so baba farid is another important poet ravidas is another important poet yeah in some textbooks you will find ravidas as raidas right r a i d a s but he's the same person yeah so all of these poems are combined together and made and made into a book and that book was called as adi granth sahib right so now you know how adi granth sahib came into being how it originated right it was the efforts or like it's it, it was it started basically because of the fifth preceptor who was guru arjun um cool quickly moving on to the next slide which is these hymns called gurbani yeah so basically whatever these hymns we are talking about till now all the poems or compositions they had a special name to it which was called as gurbani right they are composed in various languages yeah if if not original compositions at least they were translated later on and finally in the late 17th century when the 10th preceptor was actually um, ruling or like uh, showing his predominance who was guru gobind singh right with him all these compositions were concluded yeah he made sure that all the guru's poems were included as a part of that um, guru guru granth right and then he kind of made a scripture for this religion and he named it as guru granth sahib right again a very important holy book for six so initially if you draw a comparison uh, guru um, Gu- guru nanak he never wanted a religion to be established or he as discussed he even did not believe in the philosophy of religious books or scriptures right but somehow because of the change in the timings because of the fact external factors they were forced to establish this particular tradition as a religion alongside creating a scripture for themselves right also another important uh, feature of guru gobind singh the last guru is that mm, again one thing which you need to remember which was happening in the late 17th century was 
there were so many wars happening between marathas um, kalsa army like mughals were there in the central in, uh, in the northern part of india so there were so many wars happening right and to in order to protect their community in order to keep themselves safe it was kind of important for uh, the sikh people or the sikh religion sikh community to have their own army because in case if mughals are going to attack sikhs or marathas are going to attack sikhs they need to retaliate right you know in order for that to happen guru gobind singh raised an army and this army is called as khalsa panth right khalsa again a very familiar term so it was called as khalsa panth and if you roughly translate it um, roughly translated it is called as the army of the pure right again they considered themselves to be pure like very very uh, purified people and all of these people are coming together to form an army and therefore it's called the army of the pure pure right and there are five significant symbols which kind of define khalsa panth right out of those five symbols um, i mean almost all of them are followed even now right except for the dagger part yeah so uncut hair right like even now you see a lot of six following that uh, following that uh, factor we we know a lot of people sick people who actually um, tie that turban around and who still do not cut their hair right that's number 1 number 2 is a dagger dagger is again some kind of weapon which you keep um, around the waist right dagger is some kind of like this shape yeah i'm bad at figures but like you kind of know what dagger is right so that is second important symbol and third important is you are supposed to be wearing a pair of shorts yeah the, the next one is a comb and the last important single uh, important symbol is a steel bangle right steel bangle is again some kind of kada that silver bracelet uh, which people which sick people wear even today right so these are some of the kind of features which kinds of set six apart from other traditions slash uh, religions yeah and under him the community got consolidated as a socio religious and military force again military came up there was so the religion got signified it got consolidated it gained a socio religious status and all of this the credit goes to the 10th preceptor who is guru gobind singh right so that was um the class for today yeah that that also brings us to the um uh, just give me a second guys Okay so that brings us to the end of the class any questions please feel free to ask but this chapter is not yet over on monday we'll be dealing with meera bai and there is also one last segment i think that deals with sources right of um, sufi traditions so we'll look at that but in the meanwhile any questions please feel free to ask Okay Aman has a question but not related to this chapter but anyways Aman to answer your question Vijayanagara empire was founded by uh, Harihara and Bukka right again very detailed history consisting of five different dynasties so we'll deal with that in next classes when we talk about that chapter but just to give you a short answer it is Harihara and Bukka right cool um keep typing down your questions in the meanwhile i'll uh, try to wind this uh, class up because we're already past time um anyways so i was mentioning about the unacademy plus and iconic features initially so there's a special offer going on right now which started on 18 september but it is there till 4th of october 
it's a limited time offer so go grab yours now before the actual deal ends and thank you so much for tuning in i know it's not a regular class schedule but again thanks so much for taking out time and coming and joining yeah i highly appreciate it so i'll be seeing you next on monday at 6 pm back to original timings right monday 6 pm we'll come we'll be concluding the chapter if we have time we'll quickly do like some kind of short revision like shortest possible revision of this chapter and we'll be prepared for the quiz on wednesday right so that's about it any questions okay i think i've almost answered every question cool then if you all do not have any questions then that brings us to the end of the class um have a good weekend guys sunday tomorrow have fun but be safe uh till then bye i'll see you on monday again bye guys